us grace. Give us strength. Give us mercy. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Make Jesus known in every life here. Bring salvation, healing, deliverance, restoration, redemption, wholeness. In Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, come. We welcome your work, Holy Spirit. Make Jesus known more and more in our hearts, in our lives. Bring healing. Bring salvation. Bring wholeness, restoration. Show us what you think. Show us what you feel about the things in our lives, about who you are. as we transition to the next parts of our service, I just want to encourage you not to check out of what we're doing right now. Your hearts are open to Him. So as you take a seat, keep your focus on Jesus this morning. Keep your heart soft and open to hear from Him. Let's take a seat and we'll transition. We love you. Thank you, thank you, worship team, um, just for leading us before the throne. That's so great. Good morning, everybody. My name is Ryan Walker. This is my wife, Leah. Hey. And um, hey. I can already see it happening now, but uh, we want to dismiss uh, any families to take uh, any birth through five-year-old children uh, back by the fence where we came in. Um, you can do that now if you would like. And uh, but other than that, I just want to welcome everybody here. Um, it's so great to see uh, all of your faces. I love meeting out here. I'm so thankful to the Y for making this space available to us. And it's also just so cool to meet as one service. You know, I'm I'm usually a, uh, the the 9 a.m. service guy, and it's so great to have the second service people here and just so many faces. So love seeing all of you. Uh, if you are new here. Uh, or if maybe this is your first time or one of your first times coming, we would just encourage you to um, go back to the table back there, also where we came in, and just um, we would love to connect with you. Just know that you are here and reach out to you and uh, kind of bring you into the family. So uh, if you could do that. Uh, so we just have a couple uh, quick announcements for you, just schedule-wise. I know if your family is anything like ours, the calendar has been out a lot lately. Uh, with school starting and sports and extracurricular activities and all this stuff. So we just want to um, highlight a few things that are coming up. So I'll let you take all right. number one. Um, I wrote myself a note this time because when I get up in front of you, I forget everything that I'm supposed to say. So um, August 28th, for all the ladies in the house, we're having a women's summer party. Um, so mark your calendars. It's the Saturday night right before baptism Sunday. Uh, it's from 7 to 10. 
and you should have received an email if you're on my connect or you're signed up for that and you can RSVP so we can get a little better idea of how many of you will show up. And I hope to see all of you ladies there because I will say that the times that I've been and I just haven't felt like it or I've been kind of like, oh, I don't really want to go and that takes a lot of energy to talk to people. Um, I have been blessed. I have met new ladies and I've um, had more connections and it's hard to get those connections at church on Sunday. So this is an awesome way to come and meet some other ladies, make some connections and um, just we have an awesome, awesome community here. And we have some gifted ladies who put on this party. And so um, just come and enjoy, and if you have any other questions, we'll have uh, more information on that coming up in the next couple weeks, so that's it. Okay, and the morning after that, so that's the 28th, evening of the 28th, the morning of the 29th at 9.30 a.m. is our baptism service, so a little something Woo! for the baptism service. That's come the on. best. Come on. By far my favorite service of the year. I mean, it is just so awesome to celebrate lives that have been transformed and just given to Jesus. And uh, to publicly pro uh, proclaim that is just so amazing. And so um, I can't wait for that. Make sure you are here for that. Um, yes, I did say here for that. Um, we will not be able to go to Kathleen Stolle's property this year. And so we are going to do it here uh, with our sister churches from Landon and Mainville, uh, the gathering. So it's just going to be one big party celebrating what the Lord has done and is doing. So be here for that. Uh, again, more details to follow. If you are interested in being baptized or just have more questions about it, we would love to talk to you. So feel free. You can come up and, and talk to me, talk to any of the staff. And we can walk through what that means. Um, you know, I don't know. There, there may be some fear there. There may be some just unknowns. We would love to talk through that with you um, because it is just so unbelievably important and a huge part of your spiritual journey. And so um, that is the 29th. So be here. Uh, okay. Uh, I will pray us uh, into our teaching time. Lord, we are here for you. And we just, we just love you so much. Um, we give you all glory, honor, and praise. And we just uh, come into your presence now. We welcome your presence here. Uh, just speak through Josh as you so frequently do, Lord. And just use uh, your words and your spirit to, to change us, Lord. We love you. Amen. All right. Thank you, walkers. Great job. Good morning. Wow, it's so good to see all of you. Uh, for those of you that are maybe new here, I am not necessarily a regular up here in front of you guys. So if you're new, like you should come back another time. It gets better. So in case you don't like it today, <laughs> give it another shot. Um, my real job is I'm actually a junior high teacher. And the crazy thing is, yeah, let's go. School is starting back this week. Um, are there any parents in here that are excited for school to start back? Yes, yes, I see hands all across the room. They're so excited. Are there any students that are excited for school to start back? Yeah, okay. Not as, uh, not as many hands there. Um, I'm actually really excited, and I'm not just saying that. I, I really do love my job, um, so I'm really excited um, to go back. Uh, but as always, I'm really thrilled to have the opportunity to be up here in front of you guys. Um, my family and I, we love this church. In fact, whenever we come to swim at the Y, my kids always say, all right, we're going to the church pool to swim. Or when we go to soccer class, they're like, we got soccer class at church tonight. Uh, my kids are three, five, and seven. And so whenever you think of like church, when you think of like when you were a kid and you think of church, like there's certain things that come to your mind. And I just love that my kids, like when they think of church, there's like this intertwining of like, church and life here at the Y, and it's like, that's like the mission of Antioch here, is like, um, we want to be where, like, we want to go to the well of the community, where all the people are, which happens to be here at the Countryside Y, and we want to do life and ministry there, and I don't know, like, if that makes sense, like, why I'm even excited about that, but I am, like, I just, I love that uh, for my family, and I could go on and on about, like, how great Antioch is, um, 
and uh, it's fantastic, but that's not really the point of my uh, sermon today. So enough about that, but I really do love the leadership here, um, and I just feel like they do an incredible job of seeking after God and seeking after his word, and it's just like, God, what direction do you want to take this church? And so I'm really thankful to be part of this, this church, but... All right, so enough about that. We're going to get to our text this morning. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 13. And for those of you that have been coming to Antioch this summer, or you've been listening online, you know that we've been doing a sermon series through the Sermon on the Mount, which is the greatest sermon ever preached by the greatest preacher ever preached. And that's King Jesus, who we just sang about. Um, I will say this up front. This is a really difficult text. It's a really hard text, not necessarily a difficult text to understand, but it's a difficult text to hear. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. And we are going to see that uh, today. I mean, I'll be honest with you, this text, it is like an arrow at the heart. And so I'm going to take a minute and I'm just going to pray again. Um, just that we can kind of approach this text humbly and uh, just be willing to listen to what maybe the Holy Spirit has to say uh, to us through this text. So let's pray. God, I come to you now and I thank you for your word. Um, Once again, just that it's not an ancient text that was written thousands of years ago, but it is your living and active word. And um, God, you just want to, uh, at times, just undo things that are in our hearts and kind of undo our lives. And God, just show us areas this morning that maybe we, um, we're going in a different direction and we need to turn and start following after you. God, I, I just pray that we approach this text humbly. Holy Spirit, just open our hearts to what you have to say to us this morning. Um, God, we pray this all in your name. Amen. All right. Well, let's get into the text. So Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 13, and uh, it's going to go almost through the end of the chapter. Uh, We're coming to the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, It's 108 verses, and we're getting through just about the rest of them today. I think we'll we'll finish it up next week, but we're going to start in verse 13. It says, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but are inwardly, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit and the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness." Everyone who, or everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and it beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. All right, so this is a lot of text here, and there's a number of different pairs here, right? There's two roads, there's two trees, there's two types of prophets, there's two types of houses, and honestly, we could take each of these pairs, and we could spend the next two months and do a sermon over each of them, and that's kind of like my style whenever I teach, is I like to just take small chunks of scripture and just really like dig into it, and what is the text saying? Today's going to be a little different. We're going to look at this text as a whole, and we're going to kind of focus in on three particular verses, and then we're going to see how the rest of the section of scripture that we just read kind of correlate with these three, vo- uh, these three verses. So I've got three main points today, and I know the majority of you in here, you're like, you know, school starting back this week, you're not necessarily students, you're not teachers, 
But here's the deal, like I'm trying to get back into school mode here. So the three points I'm going with today are gonna be three words or phrases that are used in the educational realm, okay? So here's the three points that we're gonna do. First, we're gonna do a self-assessment, okay? And I see some of the students are kinda like cringing already. Uh, second, we're gonna do some guided discovery. And third, we're gonna talk about meeting the standards, okay? So let's uh, go back and we're gonna reread verse 21 through 23. This is gonna kind of be like our focus. Um, and I'll be honest with you, you know, hashtag real talk. Uh, these are some of the scariest verses in the Bible right here, okay? Verse 21, it says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. This takes us to point one. We're going to start by taking a self-assessment. Who are these people that Jesus is talking to here? There are four things in the text that we see. These are going to be like brief subpoints here, okay? So four things about these people. Number one, they're doing things in Jesus' name. They're Christians, or at least they would profess to be Christians. These are people that would be baptized, most likely. Okay, secondly, they call Jesus Lord. Now, the word Lord here, there is an attribution of deity. In other words, they're claiming that Jesus is God, that Jesus is the Son of God. So they're claiming to be Christians. They believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Thirdly, not only do they say that Jesus is Lord, but they say that Jesus is Lord, Lord. Now, I'm not like a language expert here, but in the original text, uh, in, like, in the Bible times in Greek, whenever words or phrases were doubled, there was this like connotation of like passion. Uh, an intensity of emotion was displayed, whether positive or negative. And so they call Jesus Lord, Lord, and this is communicating that they are people of passion. They're excited about Jesus. And then look at what they're doing. This is the fourth thing. They're prophesying, they're casting out demons. They are in ministry. They're doing the work of ministry. And not only are they in ministry, people's lives are being changed by the ministry that they're doing, right? So to sum this up, these people are fluent in Christianese, right? Like that's not a real word, but you get what I'm saying here. So they are professing to be Christians. They believe that Jesus is God. They're passionate about Jesus and they're doing the work of ministry. And what is Jesus saying about them? He's saying, I never knew you. He's not saying like, well, you were once a Christian and then you kind of like backslid out of the faith. No, he's saying, I never knew you. And so the question here is, what does it mean to know God? John 17, three says this, and this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Simply put, to know God is to be saved, to have eternal life. And what Jesus is saying here, don't miss this, he's saying, you're doing the right things, but you're not saved. Like there's no spiritual connection. There's no personal connection with me. He's saying, I never knew you. Look, like I only get to like preach here like once a year. So like, sorry that like I'm giving this like downer message today. This like isn't really my style. Um, and I don't love giving these kinds of message and I don't wanna create any unnecessary doubts with anybody in here. But this is what the text is saying, that you could be very active in Christianity, but not actually be on the rock. That you can metaphorically be a tree, but your roots aren't in Christ. Somehow, you can be all around the gospel. You can come here to church every Sunday morning. You can be involved in community group. You can go to Roots, our high school ministry. You can serve in Kid Zone, but you can still miss the gospel. The gospel could not be implanted in you. Let's go back and look at the other pairs that were mentioned in this text. There's two types of trees, right? And on the surface, they look the same, but it says when you get close, you're going to recognize them by their fruit. There's two types of prophets or teachers, and um, it describes these false prophets as like wolves in sheep's clothing. Otherwise, they look the same as like the real teachers, like the gospel-centered teachers. But when you listen to their teaching and look at their lives... They're different. There's two types of houses. They look identical on the surface, but underneath the foundation is different. One's built on a rock and one is built on sand. 
And the different foundation is what determines whether or not they stand or if they fall. Keep those comparisons in mind as we move on here. And I want to talk about, just for a second, how every religion in the world works. And once again, let me use some school terms here, okay? So every other religion in the, word, uh, in the world, this is how it works. Um, you do good things for God, and God gives you a good grade. Like, I did this work, and I earned this grade, and so now God gives me a good record. He, like, rewards me for the things that I've done. And there's actually, unfortunately, a lot of people who approach Christianity this way. They try to earn God's favor by doing good things. But the gospel actually works this way. We failed the assignment. We flunked the test. Like, I mean, we have no shot at actually passing this thing. Yet God still gives us an A+, plus, a perfect score. He gives us a good record, not because of anything we've done, which, by the way, the word for this is grace. And now because of that grace, we respond to that by living for him. Now, on the surface, both of those types of people look identical, right? Like both of those types of people live out the Christian life, but they do it for totally different reasons, right? Like the way that they view God, the way that they view themselves, the way that they view life is totally different. So I want to talk for a second about the difference between spiritual gifts and spiritual fruit, okay? Spiritual gifts versus spiritual fruit. Spiritual gifts is like what you do. It's like serving, teaching, giving, uh, worshiping, serving the poor, uh, but spiritual fruit, on the other hand, which, you know, it gives mention here, you will recognize them by their fruit. This is what Jesus is talking about here. Spiritual fruit is like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. We take this from Galatians chapter 5. This is what you are. And the people uh, in these verses, they're experiencing, ex sorry, let me get this word out. They're exhibiting spiritual gifts. But spiritual gifts are not necessarily proof that you're in Christ. But developing this fruit is a sign that your inner life is actually transformed. And if you're not seeing spiritual fruit, then what the text is saying is maybe the gospel hasn't come in. So that's the self-assessment for today. You've got to ask yourself this question. Since I have come to know Christ, am I showing development of spiritual fruit? Am I becoming a more joyful person to be around? Since I've come to know Christ and I've let the gospel in, am I more patient with the people around me? Am I more patient with my kids? Um, am I a more kind person to be around? That's the self-assessment this morning. But there's one pair that's mentioned in this text that on the surface, they don't look the same, and that's back up in verse 13. We're going to rewind a little bit here, and this takes us to point two. We're going to learn by guided discovery. Let me um, go back to verse 13. It says, enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Um, I don't know how many of you in here are, um, you read, like the version of the Bible that you read is the King James Version. But in the King James Version, it's worded like this. It says, straight is the gate and narrow is the way. Now, you often hear people um, refer to following Jesus as like being on the straight and narrow. Well, this is the verse that's being referred to here. But let me talk about the word straight for a second. And I understand that it's not like best practice when teaching the Bible to do a English word study. Okay, but like, look, I'm not David Newman. Okay, I don't have like a fancy Greek word to give you. If you're looking for that, you got to come back next week. Okay, so yes, I'm doing an English word study, but... It's okay. But I do think the understanding of this word straight is extremely profound, okay? So I always thought when I heard the word straight and narrow in this context, it meant straight like not crooked, straight. But if anyone here in here is actually reading the King James Version, you'll notice the word is actually spelled S-T-R-A-I-T. That is not a word that we typically use anymore, but the word straight actually means to be crushed or to be squeezed. And you may have actually heard it in the context of, like, we were in dire straits. That's what this word means. It's like something is going to crush me or something is going to smother me to death. Um, now, I will say I love being out here and I love teaching outside. This is a, a fantastic, like, venue for us to be in, even though somebody did mention when we walk in, it does kind of feel like you're coming into a prison with the barbed wire. But besides that, it is a great 
place for us to meet, and I love that we can meet outside. But one thing that I am kind of bummed out about is that I don't have use of technology where I can show you a video, because I watched a video this week that I feel like if I could have just shown you 30 seconds, like it would really depict this imagery that Jesus is trying to create here of like what it looks like to go to through a narrow gate. But with that being said, I think it's probably good that I can't show you that video because it would have induced a panic attack in a lot of you. So just, you know, for further uh, study, if you want to go home today, YouTube the video Claustrophobic Cave Challenge, okay? So um, <laughs> I watched all 14 minutes of it this week, and I was just sat there like, what is this? Why are they doing this? Okay, because in this video, these people are going through these incredibly tight spaces where they like have to shimmy their body through and it like looks like they can't even fit. There's places where they go through where they have to like take off their helmet because the head won't fit through these spaces they're going through. And there's even this one part where the guy's like, yeah, like all of this is held up by this little boulder right here. And the other guy's like, okay, well just don't bump it. All right. And it's like, what, what are they doing? And as I watched this, I was like, this is the imagery that Jesus is creating this path is so intimidating because when we look at the narrow path of following Jesus, we're like, man, this might kill me. Like, this is the end of my identity. But the text also says this, that this is the way that leads to life. And I love the way that Tim Keller describes this path. He calls it narrow spaciousness. I love that word, narrow spaciousness. This path looks so tight and it looks so small, but on the other side of this gate, is spaciousness in life. Like it's gonna crush us, it's gonna kill us. But when we get on the other side, there's this imagery of like all throughout the Bible of forests and lakes and waterfalls and mountains and oceans and beaches and just space in life. In fact, in the end of this claustrophobic cave video, uh, once the guys get out, it shows them like just there's a snowy scene and they're like rolling around in the snow. They're just enjoying this freedom of being out of the cave. And this imagery of following Jesus is painted all throughout the Bible. And it's kind of like this paradox we see in Luke chapter 9. If we give up our life, then we actually gain more abundant life. So on this side of the narrow gate, uh, or on the side of the narrow gate, like the other side of it, or I guess we call this the broad gate, it's kind of our default road. Our identity is so dependent on what we do, right? Like if I'm a good student, then I get good grades, um, if I do my job well, then I'll be compensated accordingly, or I'll be, like, recognized, or I'll get a promotion, or I'll get a raise. Um, if I'm a good athlete, people will notice me. Colleges will notice me. I'll get more followers on Instagram and social media. But once we go through the narrow gate, what we're saying is my identity is no longer dependent on what I do. It's a surrender to all of what Jesus has done for me. It's a dying of self that's once again talked about in Luke chapter 9. So who's on this broad road? Like, everybody. Everybody is. And the text is saying that these pairs, you know, naturally we think like, oh, well, the narrow road is like the good people and the broad road is the bad people. But it's actually the two different types of people are the people who think they can save themselves and the people who know that only Jesus can save them. Those are the two types of people that are being talked about here. And the broad road of people who think they can save themselves is so broad because it actually contains... Lots of people who are in church, even. And when I say people who think they can save themselves, this is what we see in verse 21. They're saying, look at all the things we did this. We prophesied in your name. We cast out uh, demons in your name. They're saying, look at what we did. We did this. We did this. Now reward us. And this is actually a perversion of the gospel. If we say that by keeping the law of God or keeping God, God's law, God loves me more, or I have to perform for God to love me more, like that's wrong. Here's how this works. I don't obey God's word to earn God's love. I obey God's word because I already have his love. That's grace. That's what we're talking about here. That's called grace. Listen, the broad road looks so great because so many people are on it. It's like everybody's doing it. This is what the world is telling me to do. And maybe these people do believe that Jesus is God, but he's not actually their savior. They're their own savior, and everybody's on this road. Like, everybody, like, there's liberals and conservatives on this road. There's religious and non-religious people on this road. There's people in the church on this road. There's people who hate the church that are on this road. Like, everybody is on this road. And so how do we get to the narrow gate? You know, our default road 
is the broad road. And so to get to the narrow road, we have to, first of all, we have to decide to go there. We have to like look down and see where we're at. And we have to like make this conscious effort and decision to get there. And this takes us to point number three. We have to see if we're meeting the standard, right? And what's the standard? Romans 3.23, it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Well, okay, well, we don't meet the standard. So what's the only way to know Jesus and to be known by Jesus? Well, we actually have to go through the narrow gate, and that entails two things. Okay, first of all, that takes radical repentance. Now, when we started our study on the Sermon on the Mount, maybe you can think back to David's first message a couple months ago. He went through the Beatitudes, and he talked about, blessed are the poor in spirit. We have to get to the point where we are poor, not poor like physically, but like spiritually bankrupt poor, where we say that we have nothing that we can offer. Like we are standing before God and we literally are broke. There's nothing that we can offer God to earn his favor. And there's a lot of people that say, look, like I know I've messed up, but I've still done a lot of good things. But only a Christian who understands the gospel knows that even the good things I've done are like filthy rags. That's what it says in Isaiah. Like the good things I do are done even with like bad or selfish motivation. Like even like, oh, look at me. Like I do this all the time. Like I did these good things, but I'm, I'm doing it so people see me. Even our good things that we do. So this radical repentance is going away from constantly trying to prove myself. And it means saying I'm not good enough and can't earn it. Uh, the second thing, not only does it take radical repentance, salvation is in Christ alone. And lots of people will say, look, that's narrow. That is a narrow-minded thing to say. Won't God accept good people from other religions as well? Here's the thing. There aren't any good people. Like, even in Christianity, there's no good people. And as soon as I realize I can only be saved by grace, I realize that Christianity is the only way because it's the only religion that actually offers grace. No other religion even acknowledges grace. This is the only one. And I know this is like, you know, kind of a downer message. Sorry about that. But here's the thing. Once I get to these places, once I get on this narrow path, do you know what that means? It means that there's no longer any place that I'm scared of, right? Like I see my true identity, and my true identity is that I'm a child of the king. And so when I have that mentality and I know that's my identity, it doesn't matter if I have a good day or a bad day. It doesn't matter if I have a good year or a bad year. I'm righteous and I'm loved in him. And it doesn't matter what people think. And I might still be bothered by some things that people think about me, but it's not the most important thing in my life. It's not my identity. And you've probably heard people say this all the time, like, man, I can't do Christianity. Christianity is so narrow-minded. And maybe yes, to say Jesus is the only way looks narrow, but man, once you get in, like there is life and there's space and there's freedom. And for those of, him, those of us in here that have experienced that, like we understand that and we get that. The broad road, on the other hand, here's how this works. I know I'm only doing well is if I get into, it's like performance based. If I get into a good school or if I have nice things or if I have a good job or if I have a boyfriend or girlfriend or if people like me, my identity is dependent upon that and that is so restrictive, right? To be dependent on that. The Broadway leads to death. Uh, this past week, I was in Washington, D.C. and I was visiting a friend and um, the way that if you live in Washington, D.C., the way that you get around is uh, a lot of people don't have cars. My friend doesn't have a car, so we got around a variety of ways. We rode the metro. We took a lot of Ubers. And so one day we were golfing, and we were going to take an Uber back to our hotel, and we were going to drop our clubs off, and then we were going to go eat lunch and kind of go walk around the city. Well, um, when we would finished our round of golf, we're waiting on the Uber, and my phone is at 5%. And I'm like, man, I'm about to walk around Washington, D.C. My phone's going to be dead. Uh, you know, I'm not going to be able to take pictures. Like, what is life without my phone? You know, I'm kind of like bummed out. And uh, so we get into the Uber, and it's like one of the nicest Ubers I've ever been in. It's like they have this, like, iPad on the back of the seat where you can play trivia. They've got mints in the car. They've got hand sanitizer. There's even a thing that says if you need to charge your phone, you can charge your phone. I'm like, 
thank you, Jesus. Uh, I said, hey, can I charge my phone? She was like, yeah. So she kind of passed the cord back, and I plugged it in, but it was kind of like coming from the front. So I just kind of set it down in the little bucket of mints to let it charge. And I was like, this is great. I'll be able to, I'll have freedom now to have my phone and take pictures in Washington, D.C. and do all the things I want to do. And uh, so anyway, we get back to the hotel. I set my clubs down, and I'm going to go back down to the lobby uh, so we can go out to lunch. And I go to grab my phone. I'm like, where's my phone? I left it in the Uber. (laughs) Um, And so luckily, the Uber was set up through my friend's phone, so he had a way to contact the person, but she wasn't answering her phone, so he's leaving messages, and I'm like, you know what, let's just go to lunch, it's fine. Uh, So we go to lunch, still hadn't heard from her, we eat, and we're like, okay, well, now what? And he's like, let's try again. I'm like, well, I don't want to harass this lady, but he's like, let me try one more time. So he tried, and she answered, and she's like, oh my goodness, okay, I'm so sorry about that. Uh, I'll be back to the hotel in 15 to 20 minutes. And my friend was like, okay, he'll be waiting outside. So we get back to the hotel. I'm waiting outside. My friend's got to take some calls for work. So he goes into the hotel room. 15 minutes passes by, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes. I'm just sitting out there. I don't even have my phone to look at. I'm just sitting out there. (laughs) And uh, so my friend comes out. He goes, what are you doing? I'm like, she hasn't come. So he's like, okay, let me call her again. He calls her, and she's like, oh, yeah, I had to take a ride to Maryland. Uh, I'm like, that would have been nice to know, like, I don't know, 40 minutes ago. She's like, I had to take a ride to Maryland, so I'll just call you when I'm on my way back. I'm like, on your way back? You're not even coming back yet? So I'm like, okay, well, whatever. She's going to call us, so let's go back in the hotel room. And as you can imagine, there's just, like, this stress of, like, where's my phone? Is it going to come back? We can't really go anywhere because we have to wait here at the hotel for it to come back. Finally, two and a half hours later, she calls, and uh, she's like, I'll be there in 15 minutes, and, you know, 15 minutes goes by, 20, 30. She, co- she eventually, 30 minutes later, so it ends up being over three hours later, she comes back, and I have my phone. Um, and so what's the point of this story? All this to say, don't charge your phone in an Uber. It's a bad, <laughs> it is a bad decision, all right? If you walk away with anything to that, no, I'm just kidding. And I was thinking about this moment, and I was thinking about the text and how this relates, and like, and I know this analogy eventually breaks down, but I just thought like, I was doing this thing that was going to give me life, and it was giving me freedom to go around the city and take pictures, but it ended up being so restrictive. I had to just hang back, and I couldn't do the things that we wanted to do. It was like, I was only there for a couple days, and I just wasted three to four hours of my life standing outside of the hotel. And honestly, um... The connection is here is sometimes we tether our hearts to things that we think are going to give us this freedom, but it ends up being so restrictive, and it ends up just like in the long run holding us back. Um, In fact, I've talked to a, a school counselor who says there's a lot of kids that achieve their dream of getting into an Ivy League school, but in fact, there's actually a lot of depression at these Ivy League schools. Because in their high school, they're so used to being the best and the smartest and the brightest. And they get into this Ivy League school, and everybody else is the same. And they kind of like move to the middle of the pack, and they're no longer the smartest person. And their identity is shattered. And we see this in a lot of other things, too, whether it's school or athletics or jobs. The end of this text, and I'm not going to get too deep into this because David's going to touch on this next week. We see the house that's built on a rock versus the house that's built on sand. The foundation of a rock, that's Jesus, right? That's Christ. The sand is literally anything else. Ivy League schools, our identity being in our grades, our career, money, looks. And when our identity is in anything other than Jesus Christ, it does not last. It's eventually going to fall. And so at the end of this text, like when we go back to verses 21 through 23, Jesus says, they will say to me, what he's saying is, everybody is going to meet Jesus eventually. Everybody in here is going to meet Jesus eventually. And so here's kind of the call. Why don't you meet Jesus now in grace? Do it now in grace. And that's another thing about the narrow gate. That's kind of the fun thing about the imagery of the narrow gate is like, I wish that I could take all of you with me. Like we could go through this on this journey together and we could all go meet Jesus together. But because it's narrow, it's an individual decision. You have to do this on your own. You have to go through individually. Here's the deal. Nobody is born a Christian. There's people that say, oh, I've been a Christian my whole life. I was born a Christian. You know, you may have been born into a Christian family, but that doesn't make you a Christian. 
I went to a Christian college uh, where there's a ton of people that um, they grew up in Christian families and they went off to even this Christian college and Christianity became not very real to them. And it turns out they never knew Jesus personally. Christianity was like a secondhand faith to them. It was an, an environmental faith to them. You have to meet Jesus personally. And the question for you is, have you done that? Going back to the cave video, uh, these guys in the claustrophobic spaces, these guys were going through incredibly small spaces, but they had this goal to get to this particular place. How did they know where to get? Well, at the beginning of that video, there's a guy that's saying, he's kind of drawing up a map for them. If you go here, then you're going to go here and go this. Somebody had traveled that road before them. And this is why I call it guided discovery. We have to take this road by ourselves, but somebody's done it for us. And this is some encouragement for you this morning, is that Jesus went through the narrowness of the cross to create a broad life with us. And if he can go down that narrow pipe for you, then maybe you can give up your identity and go down that narrow road for him, possibly, possibly sacrifice some relationships, Sacrifice your reputation, sacrifice your identity, but it's for a more abundant life. That's what it's for. All right. So I'm going to pray for us, um, and then uh, somebody's going to come up and lead us through a time of communion. Um, and and I just want you to think, like, have this reflective time. If this is something that, like, you're like, man, I've and this was my story. I went to church for a good chunk of my life, um, and it. There was a time where I was like, man, I have not gone down the narrow path. I haven't met Jesus personally. And maybe that's you. Maybe you've been in church your whole life. Think about that. And there's going to be opportunity um, at the end of the service. If there's people you want to come up and talk to or just pray with, um, there will be an invitation for you to come up. But let me pray for us. God, I come to you now and thank you uh, just for your word. It's a difficult text. But, God, you call us constantly throughout your word to examine our own hearts and God, we pray that, Holy Spirit, you examine our hearts. Is there anything in me that is keeping me from you? Am I putting my identity in something else um, rather than you? God, you have this abundant, spacious, free life for us. And it's difficult getting there, but you want us to have that. This life in you where we get to experience your presence. And David talked about this a number of weeks ago that that's the reward, is your presence being near you. And uh, God, if nobody in here has experienced that, I pray that this is a morning that that can happen. God, thank you for the example that we're going to see of this today through baptism, just a dying to self and a rising up of new life. And um, God, speak to our hearts this morning. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Josh. Uh, that was a great word, brother. Thank you, man. Hey, we're going to close the service this morning with two amazing symbols, uh, two symbols that, that really call out uh, the heart of everything we've been talking about this morning. Um, we're going to have communion. And we're going to have a baptism. Um, and as we do, first and foremost, um, I, I would, it would just be a great miss as a pastor of this church if I didn't look you in the eyes and tell you something that that is uh, one of the greatest passions of my heart. So can I look you in the eyes and tell you something? Uh, one day we will stand before the Lord, and I can't tell you the amount of pain in my heart that would happen if somebody at Antioch would stand before the Lord, and he would look back at them and say, hey, you did good things, you thought good things, you were part of an awesome church, and never knew you. So I, I actually just want to give you an opportunity this morning. I want to give you an opportunity to know Jesus. And I want to tell you that there is a gate that is narrow. But please hear me. At that gate is a Savior looking you in the eyes and saying, My son, my daughter, I'm calling you by name. Come home. I want you to come home. I want you to follow me down this path. Look at me. This world is broken and messed up. And so are you, and so am I. And we are separated from the living, holy God, but he sent his son, Jesus, who came to this earth. He lived a perfect life. 
and he broke his body and he poured out his blood. And that's what we're about to take. We're about to take communion where Jesus was basically saying, hey, I'm not leaving you in your brokenness. I'm entering your brokenness. In fact, my body will be broken so that you can be made whole. And with these symbols that, that he broke his body and poured out his blood, it's calling out that he died on a cross and his body, his life is the path. It's the narrow path. You can know him. You can know Jesus. You can lay your life before him and be saved and transformed and forgiven. And you can walk that path as a savior. And that is good news. Amen? That's good news. And then we're going to have another symbol, which is a symbol of baptism. And, and Blake Lamb, would you just stand up for a moment? I just want you to see his face. And you can clap for Blake. You can sit now, Blake. At the end of the service, Blake is basically going to stand up, and with one symbol, he's going to say, this is my story. I, I grew up in an awesome church. I, I knew about the Lord. I did good things. But then I realized it's time that I receive this free gift of salvation, and I become a follower of Jesus. And just a little while ago, his life was flipped upside down. He was transformed, and he's given his life to Jesus and when he is lowered into the water, this is what he's saying. He's saying, just like Jesus died, part of me died. Just like Jesus was buried and part of me is buried, washed away, and gone. Just like Jesus rose to brand new life, I've risen to brand new life. And I'm on the narrow path. Let the world see that I'm a follower of Jesus. All right? And Blake, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you that we are going to baptize you and you're going to shout that out to the world. And so now I want to ask you a question that only you can answer. Are you just kind of living a good life, believing in God, doing good things? Or have you made the decision to follow Jesus as your Savior and Lord? Have you laid your life before him and said, I need you, I receive your gift of salvation, and I will follow? And I'm just going to close in prayer before we take um, these awesome symbols before us. And I'm going to ask you if you've never given your life to Jesus and you feel that whispering on your heart. You feel like God is calling you home. This is the moment to come home. And, and you, can just, you can just pray with me. Jesus, I believe in you and I need you. And I take this broken mess of my life. I, I'm a sinner. I've run away from you. And I'm broken. And I'm calling out to you, Lord Jesus. And I'm saying thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Thank you for standing at the, at the, at the opening of the narrow gate and calling out my name. And I believe in you and I receive your free gift of salvation. And with my heart and with my life, I choose to follow you. Would you transform me? Would you make me into the flourishing son or daughter of you that you've called me to be? I love you and I choose to follow you. It's in your name I pray. Amen. And friends, if anybody here prayed that prayer inside their heart um, or you want to know more, I challenge you, uh, during communion or at the end of the service, come up to one of these people that will be standing up. We would love to walk you through what it means to follow Jesus, okay? In these next few moments, we're going to take communion. We're going to take the celebration, the body and blood of Jesus. If you did not get a communion, a little packet of elements, they're over there. Um, I challenge you to take communion, to dwell before the Lord. And when the moment's right, stand up and sing in celebration with us. Spend some time before the Lord right now, and then we'll take communion.
When darkness, when darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy game, my anchor. When darkness seems, when darkness seems to hide its face, I rest, I rest on its unchanging. I stand before 
the Lord. Let's give him praise. Let's give him thanks. Yeah. Yes, to, uh, to him who is able to pre present us faultless before the throne, uh, be all glory, honor, and power. And uh, we, are, we are done. Um, you are free to go. However, um, if you can stick around, we would love for you to stay and celebrate with Blake. Um, it's just an, a momentous occasion. It's just so awesome. And so in about five minutes, Blake is going to be baptized back here in the pool. Um, we don't want everybody to go back there, but if you can kind of hang around, if you need something to do, you can grab your chair, put it on a chair rack, talk to people. But uh, in about five minutes or so, we'll make our way to the fence line and just cheer Blake on. And um, we also... Uh, would love for you to come up during that time. We would love to pray for you. So if there's anything you want to bring before the Lord, if you have any questions about following Jesus, um, that narrow path, the narrow gate, we would love to talk to you. Uh, we'd love to pray with you for healing, for anything you have going on uh, and present uh, it before the Lord. So uh, make your way up here for that as well. And with that, you may go. Go in peace and uh, be blessed.